My name is Morgan Smith, and I am here today with the Honorable Mr. C.O. Bradford, former Chief of Police in Houston, Texas, from January 1997 to January 2004, and currently Special Prosecutor and Law Enforcement Liaison for the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Mr. Bradford was the second African-American Chief of Police in Houston and is a Black History Trailblazer. Thank you. I am pleased to be here, Morgan, to exchange information, dialogue, dis discuss some of the issues with you, as well as those in, in the viewing audience. Thank you for being inviting me. When you were appointed Chief of Police, what was your vision for the department? Uh, at the time, uh, Mayor Bob Lanier was mayor. He appointed me police chief, and subsequently, another African-American trailblazer here in our city, Dr. Lee P. Brown, became mayor, and he reappointed me as police chief. So I had had a pretty good mentor in the way of former police chief, at the time current mayor, Lee P. Brown, uh, in the way of guiding, coaching, and counseling. I made part of my goal was to provide additional guidance, coaching, and counseling to the young people because I saw too many adolescents and teenagers just being mischievous in a lot of ways, but getting tied up in the juvenile justice system. So I initiated several youth programs where the youth were in fact involved with the officers, whether it's the uh, Youth Police Advisory Council, the PAL program, the YPAC, and other programs. Some were already underway, but I expanded and created additional programs because I really wanted the youth in the city of Houston to understand more about the Houston Police Department but likewise, I wanted the Houston Police Department officers to understand more about the youth and what the youth were requesting and expecting from a law enforcement standpoint. As the second African-American chief of police, what were your top three challenges? Well, I think the diversity in the city of Houston from a, a geographical standpoint, there were 5,500 Houston police officers and 2,000 civilian personnel. So my responsibility included oversight of about 7,000 personnel. Now that was a challenge, but that wasn't the ultimate challenge. The ultimate challenge was dealing with Houston where there were a little over 100 different languages spoken in Houston. And Houston is a nice big piece of geography, but it really is a conglomerate of neighborhoods. And the things that you deploy, let's say here in Southeast Houston, to solve a problem. You cannot necessarily deploy the same strategy on the east side or the north side or the west side because of the different expectations, the different resources that are available. And more importantly, I think that each person is an individual. So we would have the opportunity to look at maybe Harm Clark, Sunnyside, South Park, Oak Forest, uh, Acres Home, Marland, and other parts of Houston and learn from those experiences. But it's a challenge trying to provide services, particularly police services, to a city as diverse and as large as Houston, Texas. So I would say, unquestionably, trying to provide services to a city with uh, a variety of, of personalities and cultures uh, within this geography is, is a challenge. Even still today, I would say. As a leader, how did you celebrate accomplishments of the department and how did you approach challenges? I think this is very interesting because how did I celebrate and appreciate challenges and accomplishments? This has to go back to uh, my mother. There are six boys and six girls in my family. Uh, one man, one woman, husband, and wife, and thanks to my mother, all 12 of us are college educated people. Now, how does this play into your question? My mother taught us that Reward is attached to performance. Now, some people may appreciate what I'm going to say and others may not. Growing up, my mother and I, we didn't celebrate birthdays because my mother said, said look, birthdays are something you had nothing to do with you being born. When you accomplish something, then we will celebrate. Now, if you brought home an honor report card or you pass to the next grade, any type of accomplishment, she would throw a party and bake what's called tea cakes. You probably don't know what those are, but some of us do. She would bake tea cakes. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that is the way one lady used a method to teach 12 children that rewards are attached to performance and there are no handouts. 
Six of us today still didn't, don't celebrate the birthday thing. The other six, well, they didn't get this message, but nonetheless. Uh, so that instilled in me to work hard and look for accomplishments, but recognize and reward accomplishments. Uh, that has served me well today. In addition to that, joining the Houston Police Department, moving through the ranks and becoming chief of police, my oldest and favorite sister told me years ago, she gave me a plaque that read, it's important to be nice, but it's more important to, it's, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. She gave me that plaque when I was a student at Grambling State University. I kept it over my door for my time at Grambling, has it at the house now. So when you move through the ranks, remember, be nice, recognize people, and also, uh, I, I say this because many of us adults, much less young students, we're going to face challenges. I faced many challenges uh, throughout my career, whether as a uh, police chief, whether as a city council member, or whether as a special prosecutor and law enforcement liaison today, there are challenges. But the thing I would say to you and, and those watching, one thing that helped me perhaps more so than anything else is to develop a network or I should say networks. As an example, develop a network of spiritual associates, a network of social associates, and a network of professional academic associates in your uh, arena. Because as you move through life and you confront challenges, even as a student, you may need to draw back, fall back on your or spiritual beliefs, friendships, association, or you may want to relax with some friends and just have social gatherings, friends in your social group, or a professional group, or in your case, it would be an academic group. So develop networks, whether it's academic, social, and spiritual. And I think falling back and drawing on the resources that are available in those particular networks will serve you well. I hope it will, because it certainly helped me along the way. What suggestions do you have to establish positive relationships between African American teens and police officers? And how do you, and how can the Christian community help to support? I think that uh, the citizens in the community must have substantive involvement into the police department because public safety is a community responsibility. I, I learned this from former police chief and former mayor, Dr. Lee P. Brown. The community must be involved in the police department. Public safety is a community responsibility. What that means is citizens, businesses, faith leaders, police officers, the district attorney, and judges are all intertwined in their role and play a critical part in keeping our neighborhoods safe. So that means that the citizens in the neighborhood, and that includes young people, that includes students just like you, Morgan, having a say so. That's why I started the Youth Police Advisory Council in the Houston Police Department, where youth from the high schools in Houston, they meet with the police chief like once a month, and we have a substantive exchange. We need to know what students are thinking and expecting, as well as businesses, business owners, and regular citizens in the neighborhood. What are they thinking? What can they tell the police department it can do better? How can the community help evaluate the performance of police officers. It is one thing for the police supervisors and the police chief to evaluate the officers in the field. But if it's real community policing, there's some aspect of the officer's job performance review process where the community can have some say-so in that officer's evaluation. See, that's real community policing. Wouldn't you like to have some say-so in about how well or not so well the officers are doing in your neighborhood? Absolutely, you should. Thank you, Mr. Zafford, for participating in this interview. Thank you. Be safe and God bless you. I'm here with Cortland Boxy today, graduate of Texas Southern University. All right, Cortland, what attracted you to Texas Southern University? Um, I would say that with my experiences, originally going to the University of St. Thomas before I started, I was an AK Omega debutante, and I was fortunate enough to be around other individuals who went to HBCUs before I started, and just 
hearing their experiences and the differences between, um, you know, just being in an environment where people care about you and they're there to nurture you and show you um, the pathway, the differences, it just inspired me to want to reach for more. TSU also had more opportunities than my other university. So um, just having the opportunity to be around other people of color, people who wanted to see me succeed, it inspired me to want to eventually switch over. Describe your overall experience as a college student. My college experience was great. Um, it was challenging and stressful. Being a student athlete, my first two years, um, having a full-time load, it was a lot to get used to. But overall, um, when I stopped playing and I switched over to TSU, I was able to pledge, AKA, and just um, really embrace the culture and um, other people who were interested in the same things I was, as well as when I joined the respiratory therapy program. So um, I really enjoyed it. Do you think there are lessons you learned at an HBCU that you would not have at a PWI? If yes, please share one. Yes, so um, fortunately, in my experience, I feel like everyone in their journey has people that come to them and grab them and pick them up. I was fortunate enough to meet somebody like that. So Dr. Andrew Taylor is a deacon here. I didn't know he was a deacon here, but he just so happens to be the head of my program. And I didn't know what he would become to me, but he ultimately became a mentor that was able to take me through my college experience. And even now we have the same relationship. Um, in my journey, my goal is to pursue medical school. And I knew that in order to do that, I would have to reach a level that I that was way above uh, the norm. And he was able to show me that way. So um, the lessons he taught me about hard work and perseverance and um, what it's like to be a real professional student that's pursuing a doctorate and the differences, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't ever repay him for, so. What advice do you have for future and current, current college students? I would say, um, just make sure you keep your priorities straight. You know, make sure that you, um, no matter what distractions you encounter, even if you make a mistake, don't give up. Just keep going and learn, figure out what your study method is. Whatever it is, just figure it out and stick to it because um, that's what's gonna get you to the end. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Preston Ayers and today I'm here with Andrea McDaniel, a graduate from Dill University in New Orleans. Louisiana, and today I'll be asking her some questions. Mm -hmm. So what attracted you to Dillard University? Okay, well, growing up, I mostly went to um, schools where I was the minority, and so um, I wanted to go to an HBCU to experience that. Also, I graduated from a pretty small high school where I was used to having, you know, small class sizes, and Dillard had kind of the same thing. And so when I went to visit Dillard, I really appreciated that they had smaller class sizes. It wasn't too big of a campus, so I felt comfortable. Can you describe your overall experience as a college student? As a college student at Dillard, um, it was really like family. Uh, the, the staff, the other students, uh, um, really made a lot of different, um, uh, cultivated a lot of different relationships. Um, I was able to meet all kinds of people. Although it's an HBCU, it was pretty diverse um, and met all kind of black people from all over the world. And so I was able to get that experience. And then with the school being in New Orleans, it was a really cultural experience. Um, and, you know, I enjoyed my time at Dillard. Do you think there are lessons you learned at an HBCU that you would not have learned at a PWI? If so, please explain. Absolutely. Um, well, I was part of Dillard University Concert Choir, and we did a lot of traveling, um, and we spread um, a lot of the message about like our cultural music, and so we were able to do those things. Um, I don't believe that I would have been able to do that at a PWI. Um, also, the staff members were, again, like very family friendly. They knew you personally. Um, we were, you know, their offices were always open. We were always able to go talk to them and develop relationships. And if they needed to get on you about something, they, you know, they did that too. So um, 
I don't believe I would have gotten the same thing at a PWR. So I do appreciate that. What advice do you have for a future and college student? And current okay. college student, okay. sorry. Um, definitely um, stay focused. Um, join a church, wherever it is that you are. Stay connected to your faith. Um, as far as school is concerned, don't procrastinate, study. Um, have fun, but have a balance and make sure that you guys are going to school and focusing and doing your work. And now I'm in my teacher mode. Um, <laughs> and enjoying yourself, but at the same time, you know, getting, making sure your priorities are in order. Okay. Hope that's all the questions we have today. Thank you for your time and enjoy your morning. Thank you so much. No problem. Hello, my name is Christopher Connor. I am here today with Jalen Jackson, graduate of Prairie View a and University, Prairie View, Texas. Mr. Jackson, what attracted you to Prairie View a and University? So initially I had a bunch of different scholarships when I was getting ready to graduate from high school and I had some different scholarships from different universities and I had a lot to consider. But you know, my mom being a Prairie View grad, she definitely encouraged me to look into Prairie View and uh, having a, a really good scholarship there and being able to graduate debt free, that was definitely my best decision. So I decided to end up with Prairie View A&M University. Okay. Mr. Jackson, describe your overall experience as a student in college. Uh, college is definitely a great experience, but I will say it's what you make it. Um, you know, if you're out enjoying yourself, you know, making friends, joining organizations, stuff like that, it can definitely be great. But if you're, you're always inside, you're not interacting with anybody, um, it can be a little bit of a lonely experience. So I definitely say college is what you make it. My personal experience, I was out. Uh, I, I made a lot of good friends. I joined organizations. I went to games. I traveled when we had, you know, football games maybe in Mississippi or in Louisiana, stuff like that. So I truly made my experience a great one. And um, I made some lifelong friends and truly just learned a lot about myself. So I think that my experience could be traded for the world. Okay. Mr. Jackson, do you think there are lessons that you learn at a historical black college or university than a uh, predominantly white institutions? Or I wouldn't say there was a specific lesson that I learned that I wouldn't have learned, but I definitely say that experiences are definitely different. You know, being at HBCU, you're around everyone who looks like you and who have gone through the same kind of experiences and struggles that you may have, you know, experienced in your life. So I definitely say that that's the biggest difference. Um, and just making it feel like a family. When I got to Prairie View, it was definitely a family vibe, but definitely a family type of engagement that we had. So I don't think that you would have gotten that from a PWI. So I'm definitely grateful for that. Mr. Jackson, one last question. What advice do you have for any upcoming or current college students right now? Um, there are three things that I would say that would be some great advice for a college, upcoming college student. Firstly, I would say that you should keep God first. You know, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And I truly uh, believe that that's something you should live by every day. Um, you know, especially being in college, there's a lot of different distractions and stuff like that. But, you know, if you're keeping God first and knowing that he's going to carry you through anything, any struggles you may go through, I believe that's one really important thing that you should, you know, do when you're in college. The second thing I would say is that, you know, college is a, an experience to learn things about yourself. You know, I feel like growing up, we have so many different outside interactions with people. Oh, you should do this. You should do this. You should look into this. But College is an opportunity to truly learn about what you, what yourself and figure out what you want to do and what impact you want to leave on this world. So I believe that that's definitely an opportunity to just learn about you and figure out what you want to do. And the third thing I would say is that, you know, you're at college to get a degree. So put that first as well. Um, you know, parties and stuff will come, going out to games and stuff will come, but you're there to make good grades and get a degree. So. Take care of your responsibilities first, and then everything else can come afterwards. Just have priorities, pretty much. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kamira Ely, and today I'm here with Adrian Earl. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm doing great, and I'm also very excited to learn more from you. I also know that you are a licensed pilot and also go to Lily Grove Baptist Church. I do. I do. I am. That's good. <laughs> yes. How long have you been here? Uh, I've been at Lily Grove for about seven years now. I started visiting with my best friend, <laughs> my best friend still to this day, Daniel Hinton. He invited me to Vacation Bible School, which is something that is a staple here at Lily Grove. And so 
it got me excited. I told my parents about it from the first night of Vacation Bible School, and it seems like we never look back, so. That's so cool. I've also been a member of Elite Girl for pretty much all my life, and it has really impacted me a lot. Very fun experiences, and there's also more to come, too. Absolutely. So tell me more. I'm also very curious on your licensed career. So what college did you graduate from and what was your major? Uh, I graduated from Avery University. It's in a very small town of Danville, Virginia, just north of the Virginia, uh, North Carolina border. So I went there and I attained a degree in aerospace management with a focus in flight operations as well as aviation business. That's good. Um, what interests you in aviation? How I first got interested in aviation was through my family. So I've been flying, I want to say, for almost all my life. I, I took my first flight at four years old to go to California. I have some family in California that we would go visit every year. And uh, as a kid, you get to kind of meet the pilot. The pilot wants to come out and see you, at, at least back in the day they did. This was in 2004, uh, I should say. So they would come out and give you the plastic gold wings and, and kind of put their hat on you and you get to take a picture and everything. So I think that was when I was first introduced uh, to aviation and that world. But I, I think even at that time, I never thought that I'd be doing it. So I, I would say the scouting program, honestly, is, is what got me truly interested at about 15 or 16 years old. So in 2015, 2016, I was in the scouting program, uh, getting very close to my Eagle Scout, and I took um, a merit badge, an aviation merit badge. It was um, conducted at Ellington Field, and so how we ended up um, conducting this merit badge was actually getting to see some of the Tuskegee Airmen, and there was one original Tuskegee Airman still living at the time. He was there, he wasn't able to fly that day, uh, but they said he was still extremely active and everything, so we got to meet him. That was extremely exciting, and I think that is the moment that I knew this is something that I wanted to do. Um, and afterwards, we actually got to go up in the merit badge and, and fly a little bit. We got to take over the controls, and that was the very first time that I was ever behind the controls of a plane, and it, it was a feeling like no other. So uh, I think I, I would have to say that would be when I when I gain my interest in aviation. Wow. Um, what is your ultimate career aspiration? That's a great question. My ultimate career aspiration, honestly, Kamira, I, I believe the, the pinnacle of my career would, would be to know that I left the industry better than I found it. Um, I think we have so many pillars in, in, and barriers in the aviation community, whether it be access to planes or uh, just finances, it's, it's a high barrier of entry. So you hear a lot in, in the aviation world about $100,000. You hear this saying about $100,000 because that's about how much it's gonna cost you to get from uh, your civilian, hello, how are you doing? I just graduated high school to the airlines. It's almost gonna cost you about $100,000 and when you see that number, it's a very scary number. It's a big number. It's, it's a huge amount of money and it's a huge commitment that you have to make to aviation. And a lot of people aren't willing to make that. And so I think either at least having the means or just exposing people to some of the ways that you can get past that barrier, um, just like I did. So I had a lot of mentors. I had a lot of help. Lily Grove was one of those places that helped me out so much if it wasn't for Lily Grove and, and the scholarship committee and the faithful people here at Lily Grove giving to the scholarship fund, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd be sitting here talking to you today, so. That's really great. Um, describe your experiences from the point that you started pursuing your pilot's license until now. That's another good question, Kamara. You're, 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 you're going, you're on a roll. So um, I would say for experience, at the beginning, Avery University throws you in the plane your first week. So I was there already on campus because I was playing football up there. And so we had a summer training camp. And you would think being a, a high schooler going into college, 
playing sports, my number one thing would kind of be, oh my goodness, okay, I'm about to go against some grown men and I'm 18 years old. You would think that would be a, a fear of mine, but honestly, that I, I think back to that and I think training camp was a breeze. I was more so looking at the first week because I had heard from some upperclassmen that they, they waste no time and they put you in the plane pretty much immediately. So my very first um, my very first flight, my very first lesson at Avery University came in my first week. And so we uh, go up in the plane with an instructor and he's kind of guiding us through our flows, guiding us through what we need to be looking for. And you don't feel prepared, right? You, it's almost like a kid learning how to swim, um, being just kind of thrown into the deep end. That's essentially what it is. And um, you're there, the, the instructor is there. And it, it's a wonderful experience, but that was my very first kind of experience. So I, it was exciting, but very, very scary. And um, I would say, a, 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 I guess another experience would be the first time that I soloed. I, I soloed at 19. Some people solo earlier in their life and some people solo later, but 19 was the age for me. And that was that was a whirlwind in itself so being up and seeing the world from that point of view is like no other you'll, you'll hear a lot of pilots talk about we have the greatest office view in the world and i have to say i agree with them our office view is amazing um you you really get to appreciate the the creation of our creator so in our belief system we in our religion, we, we believe that there is one creator, and I know that there is one creator, and seeing his creation all intertwined from that point of view in my eye, it's something that I can't even fathom. And so we take these classes in the program, you know, you have your mathematics, your sciences, you have your uh, aerospace, uh, you have your aerodynamic classes, you have meteorology, and, and physics, and so it tells you how the plane is flying and, and why the plane is flying and how it can cut through the air, but it still just kind of defies your logic because as we sit on this ground, right, we're, we're, we're pushed in our chairs by gravity. We're, we're, we're seated in our seats because of gravity, and we're nowhere near as heavy as a plane, let alone a fully loaded plane, um, being hundreds of thousands of pounds. And this is completely defying logic. And so we, we do all of these calculations and, and we do all of this science work and experiments, but it just, it still to me just doesn't make sense. And so that's how um, I remember just kind of flying and being in uh, the zone, I guess you could say in my first solo, I was just amazed. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. And I was just thanking God the entire solo and, and hoping that I made it down uh, safely. So uh, it, it was definitely by his grace, but it, 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 it tells you and it gives you a different perspective for the, for the entire uh, world, the entire makeup. So. That's really cool. I like your um, that you had the courage, you know, be able to be up there in the sky. I know for a lot of people, you know, heights they get like yes. really nervous. So it's really great that you get to do something cool like that. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, congrats on all your accomplishments so far and leading to this day. I'm actually very glad I got to talk to you today yes, and thank learn you, more. Matt. I also have one last question, though. Absolutely. I know for uh, incoming juniors and seniors, when they graduate, you know, do you have any words of encouragement for them for how when they want to do for their career or how to get to where they want to be and accomplish their goals? Absolutely. My, my number one advice to any junior and senior uh, getting ready to graduate high school would, would have to be to keep God first. So I, I can't. I can't stress that enough. I can't push that enough. Knowing God and and building that relationship um, apart from your parents' faith. So we, uh, I think Pastor Anderson talked about it a couple of sermons ago, where you were that uh, screaming child coming in, and and then you grew up, and now your parents are dragging you to church. I, I think we all go through that. There's a point in time where we all go through it. Very few of us don't, but when you truly do get to that place where you can have a relationship where you have 
said, okay, this is something that I want to seek out. This is something that I want to pursue. This is something that I want to believe in. Then it, it seems like all of the pieces fall into place and they do because he has a plan for you and your steps are ordered. And so it, it makes, it makes you have this peace. It's, there's a, there's an extreme peace that you just know, okay, if I just stay connected, right? If I just stay right here connected to the vine, then I know all of my worries, right? That I don't have anything to worry about. And so I think that would be my number one advice to anyone, especially juniors and seniors. You're going to have to step out on faith. A lot of you are leaving the house for the first time, maybe leaving the comforts of your state for the first time. And I would encourage those. I went to college out of state. I would encourage anyone to go where they want to and don't have a, a limited mindset, right? You don't want to ever shortchange yourself. And I think in a lot of ways um, that happens a lot because we want to put ourselves in a box. But you have to think back to that first advice that I gave you. You're not only putting yourself in a box, but you're putting God in a box. You're, you're telling, you're telling uh, yourself that God isn't big enough to do this for me. And when you look at it from that perspective, you tend to kind of say, OK, well, I, I don't know what I'm thinking. Right. You, you kind of you, you take a step back because you, you say, well, God is huge. God can do anything. So why am I saying that I can't? Right. I'm his child. And so I think um, just keeping keeping God first and, and staying connected to the vine is is extremely important. And, and that's I think is the advice that I would I would give any junior and, and senior. Um, just just follow your heart and and it, it'll lead you to where you need to be thank you so much absolutely good great. luck on your future accomplishments thank you so much Kamara. thank you hello my name is kerrigan gatson when i think of black houston i think of overcomers people who didn't put up or shut up about anything black history is deeper than the eye can see deeper than you and me my city, Houston, Texas, has deep roots in everything, planting the seed for our first black mayor, Mayor Lee Brown, who paved the way for Mayor Sylvester Turner, both of them watering the seeds to continue to fight for equality. Black Houston is known for its rich food, a taste that never ceased to amaze, the taste of crispy golden brown fried chicken, Frenchies fries it to perfection. And you can't forget about the soul food, the food that nurtures the soul. At This Is It, Just Oxtails, and the farmer's market, they never miss. Houston has always had deep roots in music. Our roots spread through all genres. Let's not forget about one of the people who started it all, John Biggers, during the Harlem Renaissance and one of the queens of gospel, Yolanda Adams. God always uses her in the midst of it all. As overcomers, we created spaces when we were kept out of them so that we would always have a place to go. We turned to Freedomstown. There is where we built the first black church, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. This is where the foundation of our faith were, was built. In Houston, Black History Month is a time to celebrate our prosperous Black culture. We celebrate all the things that we have overcome. Black history in Houston is my history.
let us pray so God give us all of the spirit to love all of God's humans so he gave us all of the the nice spirit in the world because is he he loves us for Jesus name amen let us pray God I want to thank you for this day thank you for all you've done for us thank you for parents our pastor Lily Grove and families everywhere Forgive us for our sins, Lord. God, thank you for the answers that paved the way for black history. They made sacrifices for us and help us realize how important Black History Month is. We want to celebrate black history every day, but not just, not just this month. We praise you, we love you, and thank you. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.